RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello Cave Dwellers, welcome to the cave for an extremely special episode for me. It's all about the Amstrad CPC 464, my first ever computer going back to 1984. And we're joined by familiar face and friend of the cave. It's Mark from Mark Fixes Stuff. Mark, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me and hello Cave Dwellers. Did you have an Amstrad CPC back in the day? No, not at all. In fact, I didn't even know anybody who had one back in the day. Uh, my first computer was an Acorn Electron. Okay, we've got one back here Lovely. behind me. Good choice of first computer for you? Well, my parents chose it because the salesman said it ran Spectrum games. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that turned out to not be true. Mm. Um, so yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I've never um, owned one of these until fairly recently, and now I have about seven. Okay. <laughs> well, um, this one actually came into my possession thanks to a donation. The individual parts were separate donations from you lovely cave dwellers, and now it's an opportunity to pull them all together and make a complete system out of those parts and give them a good home, put them uh, where they belong uh, and where you hoped they would go when you sent them in to me, because you do send them in so that they'll get a second lease of life and they'll be well looked after. So that's what we hope to achieve today with Mark's help. And Alan's here again, Alan Sugar of Amstrad. Um, Alan, do you want to pop the kettle on? Hello, cave dwellers. Yes, of course, lads. I'll get right on it. And while he's doing that, here's a primer on the 464 so we can all get up to speed on exactly what the machine is. And by the time you come back, we'll be ready to tear it apart and try and give it a new lease of life. Take it away, Neil. The CPC 464 was the first of Amstrad's CPC range of computers released in 1984. It was followed up by the 664, 128 and was expanded upon for the Plus range as well as the much ridiculed GX4000 games console. Amstrad had been successful in the consumer electronics market, notably selling low-cost hi-fis with styling that passed them off as higher-end equipment and the public largely bought into this approach. It looks like the real thing, I can afford it, I'll take it. The 464 continued this style. In a cutthroat 8-bit market in the UK dominated by the ZX Spectrum, the 464 offered a proper keyboard, a dedicated monitor and diagrams. This looked like a real computer compared to that toy-like Speccy and at £299 with a colour monitor or £199 with a green screen monitor, it was fairly affordable. Inside, there was a fairly respectable, if uninspired, machine with a Z80 CPU, 64K of RAM and a range of colourful video modes for games, as well as a high-resolution mode suitable for business software. Simplicity was key to its design and that's conveyed by the single power plug. Plug the monitor in, which in turn powers the computer. Even a child could set it up, and I did, when I got it one Christmas as my first ever computer. The later 664 and 6128 models would replace a tape deck with a 3-inch disk drive. Amstrad opt in for the 3-inch format so as to distribute and profit from their sales, rather than let other companies profit from the more standard 5 and a quarter and later 3.5-inch format that we all know and love. A disk drive could be added to the 464 though with this, the DDI1 expansion comprising of an interface as the ROM in the 464 doesn't natively support a disk drive and the FD1 floppy drive, which is a pretty long unit. You'll need a deep and wide desk for this setup. The CPC range would be discontinued in 1990, having sold around 3 million units, with great popularity in France and mild success in the UK, Spain and Germany, where it was sold under the Schneider brand. There you go, lads. Tees up. Oh, thanks, Alan. <laughs> What is this? Nobody makes Alan the tea boy. Make your own tea, and while you're at it, get me one. Milk, nah, sugar. <laughs> There's a fresh cup for you, Mark. No thanks to uh, Alan. Oh, thank goodness. Now, hopefully that primer has brought you up to speed on the 464. We now need to pick a, a component to uh, okay. start work on. I'm going to go for the computer itself. Okay. What are you going to um, go for? I'll go for the drive. For the drive. If you want to set up here, I'll go over to the lab and use that workbench. Sounds reasonable. And we'll cut between the two of us and see what we discover and what kind of condition these parts are. And then we'll come back and look at the monitor. And hopefully, at the end of it, we'll have something to show you. Hopefully. Otherwise, we'll just pretend nothing happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
At around 57 centimeters wide, I'm not joking when I say this is one of the widest micros you'll come across, but having that tape deck integrated does make for a tidy setup with minimal wires on your desk. I really do like it. Cosmetically, it has seen better days with a few scratches and some faded colors. The diagram on the tape deck really should be red more than orange, but the real filth on this machine is not on the outside. The first sign of muck is on the edge connectors at the rear, something that will need to be operational if we're to use the disk drive interface. It's very dull and it has a film of dirt all over it. So let's crack our Amstrad open and see how the rest of the system looks inside there. Whilst Neil deals with the main computer, we'll turn our attention to this drive. Whilst Neil has grit and grime, this drive unit has had a totally different life experience. It's so clean. There's two long screws securing the bottom of the unit. It's easy to remember where they go, so we'll just place them to one side. There's also two machine threaded screws that go straight through the unit into the actual internal disk drive itself. Once those are removed, we can remove the top and we can see that indeed this is a very clean unit. Next, we'll be removing and servicing the three inch drive itself. Back to you, Neil. Carefully opening the machine so as not to break the keyboard ribbon cables on the right here, we can see it's absolutely filthy. Based on past experience, Mark and I would guess that this was stored in a garage, collecting dirt over the years which was exacerbated by car fumes and all other wonderful things we do in our garages. It's a stubborn, greasy film all over everything. Through the dirt though, you can see what a simple system this is with a CPU, RAM, gate array and discrete logic laid out neatly on a board with ample space in that large case. Aside from the dirt, there are early signs of corrosion on the legs of the CPU and also the gate array, so we'll want to clean that off. An interesting footnote is that multiple models of gate array appeared in this machine. The ever frugal Mr Sugar did not like to be tied down to one particular supplier, hence three different types of gate array. They were made by Ferranti, SGS and LSI and featured a mix match of different pinouts and technology types in the fabrication of their chips. Away from the main board is the cassette deck on which we have a chunk of plastic which certainly doesn't belong here. And it didn't take long to track down where it should be so we'll have to get that super glued back into place. Let's get this sorted then and to give it a deep clean we'll want to remove the system board entirely from the case and then pop out the CPU and gate array and scour those legs with a fiberglass pencil to scrape off the surface corrosion that started to form. The filthy edge connectors I'll now tackle with some metal polish, in this case Brasso branded polish, which we'll apply, leave to go to work for a bit and then buff off. After a polish they're certainly much shinier, but we don't get away scot-free with such abuse. There is pitting on the connectors. If it's too far gone then some DIY replating with some solder might be in order, but we'll give it a try first and see how we get on. To clean up the board, ports and all, I'm using contact cleaner, which is essentially compressed air and a cleaning agent such as IPA, but I do find on dirtier jobs, the cleaning agent in this particular contact cleaner, which is WD-40 branded, really does get the dirt shifting. I'm liberally dousing the board in contact cleaner, wiping off the bulk of the filth, and then using brushes to get between the components and shift away the dirt. Providing you don't see any corroded or damaged components that you might flick off and lose, then you can really quite vigorously brush the grime and dirt away, like some kind of 8-bit micro dentist. Say ah. Ah, indeed. This FD1 unit is now wide open. All we need to do is remove the drive cable from the back of the drive. This can be a bit difficult in the limited space, so do be careful. Once you have that removed, you just need to remove the power cable. Do this by lifting up the plug and pulling it out to disconnect the notch. And then furthermore, there is a grounding strap which is screwed into the metal of the top of the drive itself. This drive's really, really clean and looks like it's probably only been used once or twice in its lifetime, but we'll service it anyway. Next, we need to remove the two screws that go into the bottom of the front bezel. When these are taken out, you can take off the front bezel, 
but do bear in mind that the PCB on the top needs to go into the groove at the top to reinforce the bezel on reassembly. Flipping the unit over, we're ready to remove the main logic board. The two screws towards the back of the drive are the same but have different washers. Trying to lift up the board you'll find you're restricted, but that's just because of these wire clips holding these cables. You can easily bend them up and down to remove and replace the cables. On this particular type of 3 inch drive, which I find quite common in the Amstrad series, I actually prefer to remove the plugs from the board. This will allow you to open up the entire unit and you'll get unfettered access to the area you need to work on. On the underside of the drive, that's mainly the belt pulley area and the pulley wheels. Now starts the laborious process of cleaning up the old belt. The eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that there's bits stuck to the drive wheel and these need to be removed. It's very icky and very sticky stuff, so if we don't get it off, it will ruin any refurbishment we do with the new belt. I tend to use a small flat tip screwdriver against the edge of the wheel and rotate it to remove any large lumps of rubber debris. Now we can turn our attention to the smaller brass drive wheel. It's attached directly to the motor and we can see it's kind of got this Catherine wheel of licorice wrapped around it. But no, that's the rest of the drive belt which we can remove with the tip of the same screwdriver. This stuff is incredibly gooey so try to get as much off in one go as you can. This then leaves the unenviable task of trying to remove the belt that's stuck to the brass. This adheres quite effectively so I'm using acetone here. Acetone is found in most popular brands of nail varnish remover. It's very very aggressive though so please do use it with care. I've given both wheels a once over with acetone to ensure that they're clean before fitting the drive belt. Once the belt's in place, rotate the wheels to make sure that it's seated correctly. With the belt firmly in place, we can start to reassemble the drive by simply reversing the disassembly process. Let's see how Neil's getting on with the CPC. Look at that beautiful clean board. You can actually see the nice green of the PCB now and not black grease. Turning our attention to the tape deck, it's not dissimilar to the disk drive that Mark's been working on. Same kind of mechanisms, differently packaged media. The tape drive is driven by rubber belts, which we'll need to replace for the drive and also the tape counter. The keyboard, which will pop off, is a fairly delicate thing on the CPC. You can rip keys off of it in the normal way, but the plastic posts they sit on are quite fragile and can easily be broken. Considering this is as yet untested, I think we'll just wipe the keyboard down and then test it before targeting any faults we may find in it. It's not just the tape deck in this assembly, it also comprises of the speaker, power light, power switch and volume control with wires snaking across and around the whole thing, so we need to lift it all out as one. A really common fault on the CPCs, probably the most common, is a faulty power switch, so we'll give that a quick clean and it's a very easy task to do. We just unscrew the mount and then carefully bend the arms which grip the outer casing onto the assembly. And then we pry that open and once inside, there's just a pivoting metal plate which the plastic switch pushes down to complete the circuit. If this gets dirty, then nothing happens. So we'll give it a blast with contact cleaner and a good scrub. And that's all there is to it. If your CPC won't switch on, then this is the first thing to try. It was faulty on my 6128 and I know Mark has had the same problem on recent 464s he's worked on. Now the tape drive has a glaringly obvious problem as soon as I started cleaning it. The chunk of rubber which is floating about here is part of a tyre which should be on the wheel next to it. And it's completely perished. So we'll pick that out. There it is, no use to us in that state. And the purpose of this tyre is to make contact with the larger wheel next to it which turns the cassette tape, causing the tape to spool. The rubber tyre giving it the grip it needs to turn that wheel. As luck would have it, a kind chap by the name of Ben had a spare pinch roller available with the tyre intact. It was used, so I lightly sanded the rubber tyre to scuff it up a bit so we get a bit more traction, and then I cleaned it off with some IPA. In this instance I'm replacing the whole arm, wheel and all, but I'd love to find a suitable tyre to put on the wheel for a new replacement and I'm working on that. 
If I find a solution, I'll share it with you so we can all keep our Amstrads operating like new. Fitting the arm back in is fiddly, but possible without additional disassembly. It slots in from the rear like so. And then it screws into place. And finally, the spring is hooked around to complete the installation. Now when we engage the play button, there's contact between the two wheels and enough traction to drive the tape. Perfect. And there's our old wheel, which I mentioned I need to source a new tire for. The new belts go on now, and then we can take a quick look at our tape counter. This works, but the reset button has snapped. It's another very common fault on these machines, and not one that can really be resolved without replacing the whole counter. The counter has a belt attached to it which drives this wheel and causes the numbers to turn. When you press the reset button, which is integral to the whole internal assembly, you can't just glue that back on easily. When you press it, it pushes away the cogs, which causes the counter to spring back to zero. This then will go on my eBay watch list for a working replacement counter, which I can pop in if I find one. But it won't stop the machine from working in this case. The numbers will still turn, I just can't reset it. Let's see how Mark's getting on with that disk drive. Thanks Neil, and things are going really well over this side of the man cave. With the drive belt installed, all that really remains to be done is to lubricate some of the mechanisms in the drive. After 30 years, this worm screw can get quite dried up, as can the head sled rail. We'll put a blob in front, but not quite that much. That's a better size and also a blob behind the actual head sled assembly and that will propagate that grease naturally for years to come. Looking at the rest of the drive unit, I've never ever had any problems with any of the capacitors in an FD1 unit. They're quite large and despite being near this massive heat sink and transformer, I've never had any that have dried out. All of this part of the drive is dedicated to power all the drive logic is actually held inside the FD1 interface. So let's put this back together. Again, it's a reversal of the procedure we saw earlier. Not forgetting that really important earth link. We'll put the top of the case back on and start screwing it back together. It's a very simple unit with the four screws that we removed earlier. A quick wipe down and it's going to be as good as new. The DDI-1 is the disk drive interface one and it plugs onto the expansion connector of the Amstrad CPC-464 adding in the drive commands and electronics that it lacks. This one's in pretty good condition although the cable itself is a bit dirty and I can never quite remember which one of these needs to go into the first drive. We'll clean off the cable. I feel a bit bad that this is all I've really had to clean looking at what Neil's been up against. With that in mind, I think I'll help Neil. I'll roll up my sleeves and with some hot soapy water, we'll start cleaning off the case. There's a wide array of chemicals and cleaning agents you can buy out there, but more often than not, you can't beat hop soapy water, a soft cloth, and some good old fashioned hard work. Look at that, a genuine 80s stew full of the hopes and dreams of a generation. And what looks like a spider's leg. Here you go, Neil, you can have it back. Thanks Mark, and all that remains is to fit everything back into the case now, being very careful to keep all the wires away from the moving parts of the tape assembly so that nothing catches when it's in use or slowly wears away. This spring here is a crude but very important component. It springs open the tape deck when you hit the eject button, so be sure to screw that in correctly and firmly back into place. There you go, you can see it forcing the deck open there now. And with the final screws in place, I think it's time to test it all out.
So Mark, we chose not to open up the monitor only to give it a clean, but you did suggest that we power it on and leave it for about 20 minutes first. Why was that? Sometimes vintage electronics need to be powered on for a while so things like electrolytic capacitors can reform. Otherwise they might not work at first and this is just something I've learned over time. And then we were ready to test it. Yes, it wears the scars of battle. This isn't a perfect cosmetic restoration. It has the patina of a 35-year-old micro, but I am very pleased to report that on testing it with a tape, those cogs are turning, regardless of the absence of our reset button. And sure enough, the game began to load and completed loading. In this case, the game was finders keepers and I was able to play it perfectly. One nil to us, but what about that disk drive, Mark? Well, let's find out right now, Neil. We'll make sure the machine's off, turn the drive on, and we're going to try to load Sorcery Plus, a disk which works in another machine. Pop that in, turn the machine on, and with a little bit of DOS black magic, we'll hold our breaths and hit enter. Well, the drive LED's going, so that's a good sign. And the loading screen is an even better sign. I think we've done it. I'd call that 2-0 to Retro Man Cave and Mark fix his stuff. Okay, Mark, so what would you call what we've done today? Is it a refurb? Is it a restoration? What, is it a clean? <laughs> What have we done? Uh, well, I think, yeah, it's basically a clean up and a refurb. So we've yeah. taken the drive apart here. We've um, put a new belt in. We've lubricated it and checked it works. Um, taken the Amstrad apart, given it a clean. Mm -hmm. You had some interesting um, things that you found inside with the, uh, the CPU. I did indeed. There was a little bit of corrosion on the legs of the CPU, as you saw. The the main problem for me here was is in the tape drive. There's that little bit of rubber that goes around the wheel that then drives the tape. Yep. Uh, and of course, that had completely perished. Yep. This looks and runs fantastic. It doesn't make a noise, does it? You don't it know. doesn't make a noise. It's very, very quiet. And it looks like it hasn't been used very much. And we can see it's labeled up as drive B. So this might well have been the one at the bottom of the stack because yeah. there's uh, two connectors here for drive A and drive B. And the manual says they must be stacked uh, one above the other. So it's, chances are this probably got used maybe twice, three times in its life, yeah. which is great news for us. And it took a little, little bit of wiggling to get going with the interface. So this CPC isn't without battle scars. Let's be honest, we haven't restored it to perfect condition. No. There's a scratch here and there. The red lettering um, or the background on the lettering has faded a bit. Uh, and the interface needed a bit of wiggling even after we cleaned it up with the uh, metal polish. Yeah. But it did get going. So I think we just need to accept it has a certain amount of patina about it. Um, it's a bit beaten, but it does now have a good loving home and it will be well used. And the monitor is, uh, is we just gave that a dust down really. Um, yep. We could take it apart and recap it, but it's working absolutely fine. At the it's moment, working great. It? It's got a really good quality image. It has. So uh, we won't uh, fiddle with that in fear of actually breaking it. Yeah. <laughs> that it happens broke. sometimes. Don't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pretty happy. Alan, are you happy with how things have gone? I like Amstrad's. Excellent, Alan, excellent. Well, I'm really pleased to have a 464 in the collection to go alongside the 6128. If you haven't seen that restoration, that's a full series on the 6128, so go and check that out. And also the video where we looked at the entire range of the CPC computers in the Swindon Museum of Computing. All the links are below and a link to Mark at Mark Fixes Stuff. And what have you been restoring recently on your channel, Mark? Oh, um, recently, well, my most recent video was a Spectrum, boo hiss. But um, <laughs> uh, recently I've been working on some Amiga machines. Okay. Um, so that should be coming up pretty soon. Also some stuff on the PC Engine and some stuff on the Philips CDI. Excellent. Well, if you like my channel, I can guarantee you'll like Mark's channel. Really good in-depth restorations. Well worth a look. I'm a happy subscriber and uh, you should be too. Thank you as always for watching. Take care and see you next time. Bye.
If you enjoy my content and would like to support The Cave while receiving a completely ad-free experience and access to releases one week before they go public, then visit patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers. Thank you for your support. I like Amstrad's. Amstrad's.